Father in heaven, we ask you for the spirit of grace. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us all truth as you have promised that the Comforter would come and that he would guide us into all truth. It is so expedient, Lord, that uh, we have the gift of your spirit. Uh, for your spirit is to, to lead us, to comfort us, and to lead us in the truth and uh, to convict us of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. Uh, I heard uh, my, my brother, I, he quoted a verse earlier. He said that uh, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And how can they hear lest, lest there be a preacher? And uh, we pray, Lord, that just now I surrender and yield myself to you, Lord, to your using. And I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to, uh, to me as well as the people, and that you would uh, convict our hearts, and that you would... Uh, that you would uh, dwell within each one of us today and bless us as our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. I want to invite everyone to turn in the book of 1 John, chapter 5. And uh, oftentimes when I'm preparing a sermon, you know, coming up here, I had to, you know, in doing all the media work, we try to cover all our bases because uh, you have so many different speakers and they all have different speaking styles. So you have uh, a couple different cameras to pick up a couple angles on their face and uh, but then you have uh, one, one picture that might be uh, pointed at the marker board because sometimes uh, preachers, that's where they want to they wanna hover over the marker board. And some, they'll just stay s still and they'll just read from the Bible. And then others, they, uh, they like the projector screen. So he'll have all types of quotes on the projector screen. And uh, each one of those things have um, avenues or, you know, God creates variety to be able to speak the hearts and minds of, of his children. And, uh, but I had to be a little bit uh, true to my nature. I was teasing with uh, my, uh, I like to call him my pastor, but uh, my brother, dear brother, uh, Pastor Perch. Um, he went up here and he had his uh, stuff on a projector screen and he didn't use any of them. <laughs> so uh, I, I told him before he get up there, I said, you know, you're going to, I don't, I can't, for, I can't see you using a projector, but he was going to try it. And uh, so today, I noticed that uh, my preaching style is similar to his. As uh, I try to use a projector screen just like him, and I often have the same struggle. And um, and that I have to be a little bit true to my nature. I and and realize that I, I like to favor the scriptures and I like to favor the marker board. And I'm very similar to him in that sort of a way. Um, so we'll be going through the scriptures. Oftentimes, I struggle when I. Going up to preach, um, I will have uh, things that I've, uh, I know from the scriptures, I'll be praying, but oftentimes the Lord will, you know, change the sermon on you or what it is. And I've oftentimes throughout my ministry have, uh, have realized that the, the greater part of my preparation for a message is actually prayer. Um, because um, when I go and I pray, um, I, I, it's just the type of creature that God has created me, you know. Um, there's so much more that a person that has it on the projector screen uh, that can teach the people and through the visual um, aids are able to advance the truth by the people being able to read what is on the screen. But unfortunately, I'm not that kind of creature. I, 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 I love those kind of presentations. It assists me and I wish I could have that uh, a little bit more in my ministry. But... I have to be true to my nature and realize, uh, you know, I, I go and I pray and, and I just wrestle with God until I just have a sense like God is telling me like, yes, that's, that's the right sermon. And oftentimes he waits until just before I, I get up to preach. And sometimes he'll use some of my sermon that I've prepared. And sometimes he says, no, I need to, I need to doctor your message here at the last minute. <laughs> and uh, so there's some of us... Um, that God keeps us on our toes this way, and uh, I'm, I'm one of those types. And uh, today, we're going to be looking at the scriptures and uh, in the direction that I believe the Lord wants us to go today in today's message, as it becomes necessary in laying the foundation, as I believe I have uh, two talks uh, during this camp meeting, 
possibly t three if I have to fill in for someone. And uh, it becomes very necessary throughout this, uh, what I felt impressed in the chain and the direction that we're going, is to study a little bit about the government of God and how his government works and the plan of salvation and how all these things uh, work throughout the scriptures. Oftentimes when, you know, I gave my life to Christ and I repeatedly give my life to Christ, have, have any of you experienced that? It's, uh, you know, it's an ongoing warfare. Uh, it's not once saved, always saved. You can't just give your heart to Christ and then the next day as if uh, you're just going to be, uh, your heart is always going to be His. We live in a, in a world that is assaulted by sin and selfishness. And Satan is always trying to assault you to call out the carnal man out and uh, the man who is not created in Christ Jesus. And uh, oftentimes, uh, as many times there's points in my life that all of us have these similar circumstances, and that is there's points in your life where that is where God reaches you in reflection. I believe it was, uh, was, it, uh, was it Nathaniel who was preaching under a tree, having his devotional life, and you know, when I was a child, God was trying to speak to me even when I didn't even recognize it. And as I'm older, I recognize that. You know, I would take all the pain in my earlier experience. I had an eldest brother, not, you know, not the one that you guys know. Uh, my eldest brother, you know, he was sometimes pretty hard on us, you know. Uh, and I, don't, I think in hindsight, if he looked at it, he, he probably didn't realize it. But he was very hard on us. And, uh, and sometimes with me being the younger, uh, younger child, you know, I, it was harder for me. And uh, not only that, but then also just the dealing through life in school, and then later the parents get divorced, and all the things that go through that. All of us have things and experiences through life that we don't know how to cope with. And it creates a lot of stress for us. And that stress, you know, the Lord will try to speak. And without Christ, we have nowhere to take these things, these burdens. And it piles up on us, and many of us drowned ourselves in sin and uh, all types of habit in order to alleviate ourselves from the pressures that this wicked world has upon us because God created us as His creation. And just as a child needs his, uh, their parents, so do we as uh, Jesus in, in God's created creation. We need our Heavenly Father and we need uh, Jesus Christ in our lives. It's, it's unescapable. But what happens is, is we try to drown ourselves in sin in order to forget that need. But the need is always underlying. It's always there. So I remember as a young man, I remember that I, uh, my mother said that even from a child in diapers that I like to climb everything. Uh, and that's true. And oftentimes that would get me into trouble. But I remember as a young man, even before I was a teenager, I would go, we had uh, old growth walnut trees in our, in our backyard. And I remember that I used to cr climb this walnut tree and I would climb to the very top where I would almost break above the canopy. Very dangerous. I imagine if uh, your parents saw your children doing that, you'd uh, forthwith say, come down. But uh, I was a little bit uh, desirous to flirt with danger in that way. And I remember I'd climb to the very tippy top and it was almost like I didn't understand what I was doing. I was trying to get away from this earth. I look back on it and, I was, and subconsciously I didn't realize I was trying to just get away from this planet. Call, call, climbing up there as high as I could. Well, back then I wasn't as big as I am now. You know, I, there's no chance I could ever climb a tree that tall, high anymore. You know, I, I'm, I'm too big of a man. But back then I was younger and smaller and I could do that. And I would go up there and I remember I would find a branch and I would lock myself into those tree limbs. And I would stay up there for hours. Hours. I would stay up in the top of these trees. And, and, I, would, and I would just be up there and I'd feel the wind and, and I would just feel all sorts of kinds of emotions. You know, and, and, and I would do this regularly because it was, seemed to be like the only place where I could find relief from this world and all my sorrows and, and everything that was taking place and all these new experiences as being a young man and, and seeing all these different things and not knowing like what all this stuff means and how do I cope with life and there I would climb that tree and what I didn't realize at that time 
is that I was calling out for God. That God was meeting me there in, a, in, in my own adolescent way. God was meeting the, me there at the top of those trees, and that's where he was speaking to me. But I didn't realize, I didn't fully realize it, I, but subconsciously I, I knew that's where I was receiving peace. Nathaniel had that experience, and uh, he would go underneath a tree. He would find himself and pray under a tree, and he would have that experience. So when Jesus came and said, follow me, and, and, uh, and Jesus made reference to him, seeing him underneath that tree, he clearly recognized that that voice that he was hearing, the yearning of his soul that he was experiencing underneath that the spot where he would have prayer, was God. And when Jesus said that he saw him there, he immediately recognized that this was the Christ. Yes. Oftentimes, many of us have our different places that we have points of reflection. Oftentimes when we're laboring and working, we don't have time to reflect. Um, I remember as I grew as a, a teenager, uh, after my parents uh, was split, as uh, uh, many, it's so all too common these days. It's more common for split parents these days than it is for parents to stay together. It's, it's unfortunate. But at that time, I was uh, trying to, I just had moved into my, uh, I gave my heart to Christ, and I remember moving into my father's house, and my prayer closet was the shower. <laughs> and the reason being is because there was nowhere in the house where I could possibly be alone. It was a small house, and I was, I was sleeping on the living room couch. That was my bedroom. It was the public place, and there was no place for me to be alone except for in the shower. And to this day, I can't get in the shower without the urge to kneel down in the shower and start and spend a little time in prayer. It, uh, it, it formulated my life in such a way, you know. Um, all of us have these places that we go to retreat. Uh, it's, it's, it's written in our very genetics and code. Some of us, unfortunately, tries to ignore that need and bury it in habits of sin. Um, Oftentimes, when we reflect at these times, one of these times that all of us have, and that is, is when we retire at night to go to bed. Has anybody been able to be, has been troubled in mind and not been able to sleep? It's because you've neglected talking to Jesus. And uh, at this time of reflection, when your mind isn't busy with the cares of this life and doing the different things, just before you're able to sleep, the Holy Spirit has the opportunity to finally to speak with you. And sometimes our mind will be running and we'll be thinking about our days, we'll be thinking about our past, because oftentimes the Holy Spirit, that's what the Holy Spirit is sent here to do. It's about to speak to us and cause us to reflect our, about our hearts and our lives and our experiences. And oftentimes, even to this day, sometimes when I reflect before going to sleep, I often think about things that I have done in the past. Has it, have any of you experienced this? And sometimes a memory will come to you about something that you had did and, and all suddenly you'll be laying there still in bed and, and the thought and memory of it will make you just go, Oh, can't believe I did that. Has anybody ever experienced that? I see everybody's hand. It's a pretty common thing. We'll, we'll just go, Oh, I, I, ooh, I can't believe I did that. Oh. The Lord wants to speak to us, and, uh, and oftentimes when we have that experience and we think about that, and we, when we have that experience, I can't believe, oftentimes, sometimes we will, it will generate a thought like, oh boy, if I could just go back and do it all over again. But the thing is, if we can, if, and that's the question I want to present to you, if you could go back and do it all over again. Let's think about that for a minute. Are you the same person now as you were back then? No. Yes. no. In other words, you are the same ex person as far as like your genetics and who you are as, you know, but as far as like your character. In other words, throughout your experience, even though you may not be a Christian, the Holy Ghost is warring with you throughout your entire life. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it actually says that the angels are ministering spirits sent 
to us, from God, to us, to those who will be heirs of salvation. Matter of fact, uh, keep your finger where I told you to go. Let's turn to Hebrews. Let's just follow the leading of the Spirit. Amen? The book of the Hebrews. Let's notice what it says. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 13. Let's notice what the scripture reads. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. Is, is everyone there? All right, the Bible says, But to which of whom? So we're speaking about the angels here. Said he at any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all what? Ministering, Ministering spirits sent forth to do what? Minister for them who shall be heirs of what? Salvation. Salvation. So here, the Bible says that ministering spirits are sent forth to be heirs of salvation. And so we have, the, we have angels, we have the Holy Ghost. And throughout your lifetime, even though you're not professing to be a Christian, these ministering spirits are faithful. And they go throughout your lifetime, and especially uh, you're in... You know, you got a, uh, you know, I, I knew a, a dear brother um, before he passed away, the late um, uh, An uh, Brother Duckett, we called him. I believe his first name was Anthony. Anthony Duckett. Charles, Charles Duckett. Thank you. And uh, Charles Duckett, he used to have a car, and on the car, he had uh, made a, a big sticker on his car, and it said, uh, God's Bounty Hunter, <laughs> because he was an evangelist, and he was seeking souls. Well, uh, some of you grandparents are God's bounty hunters, and your prayers, when they go out, it, all it does is empower angels to work even more for your children and for your grandchildren. Amen. You know, my grandmother, she said that she, uh, that she said uh, she had four boys and four girls, and then she took care of a couple, you know, uh, adopted kids. And uh, she said she just prayed and prayed fervently that God would give her one of, at least one of her sons, would be a minister and would preach the gospel. <laughs> At least one preacher, Lord. And she always thought it would be my dad, but my dad, he, if anybody knows him, he, is, uh, he, is, he does not like to be around crowds. He's kind of a little bit introverted in that way. <laughs> but the Lord has been working with him. And, uh, but instead, the Lord said that the Lord blessed me and he didn't give me just one son, but he gave me, he gave me three grandchildren that began preaching the gospel. And uh, me, me being referenced, I remember we used to receive, uh, when we were falling away or doing our own thing as young, uh, we would always receive from Grandma a letter. And these letters were like Ellen White letters. They, they, would, they would be almost so piercing, you would read them and you'd, you'd, always wa you'd want to hide them and make sure nobody would be around to see it when you're reading it. And she would just be appealing about how Jesus is about to come and how, you know, I saw it, me and your grandfather was driving in town and we saw you with some of the street boys in, in town. And, and, and then, then she would write words of warning and correction and then she, would, then she would write words letting us know that Jesus was about to come and he loves you and, he want, and you want to see him in peace when he comes. And she would just appeal and she would send these letters anytime uh, she became aware and somehow... That, the Holy Spirit had to tell her sometimes. She's just like, how did she know? <laughs> and uh, so you mothers, grandmothers, uh, you keep pressing your prayers and your petitions to the throne. And those angels are working for you. You have an army at your disposal. Um, so... Where, where was I taking this now? Uh, so sometimes we have those experiences and, and we ask ourselves if we could do it all again. But the overall question when we ask ourselves this is, the, I, don't have, I don't have the wisdom and knowledge that I possess today. Uh, when I was first born, I had to have, I had to go, that's not to say that you had to have failures. You could have had victories had you had listened to God's word. But those experiences and those failures, sometimes God uses those to teach us and to, and to form our characters. And so in the end, uh, when we get to heaven, we're all going to say, heaven was cheap enough. Yes. We're going <laughs> to say, like, I would not have changed anything because I'm here, I made it. The Lord. Yeah. I, I point these things out to say, 
that when we were born, we don't come into this world with an adult mind. We don't come into this world knowing, knowing everything. Uh, and so I want you to take that in mind and consider just in the same way that you're a created being, how about the angels? Were the angels created beings? Yes. And when they were first formed and created by Jesus, um, do you think that they knew all the ins and outs of the gospel? Or was it when Jesus died on the cross, it was a grand revelation for all of the universe? I think so. You see, with the angels, they didn't have to fall. See, God will still, still teach you all the lessons that you learned in life. And it wasn't necessary for you to have fit, made any failure throughout your life. And he could have taught you the same lessons. Unfortunately, sometimes we have to learn those lessons by our failure. And through God's compassion, he, he lifts us back up. And it is his purpose and his divine direction that he wants to save us. Amen? Amen. Amen. So he wants to lift us up. So looking at this, I want to turn in. We were going to 1 John chapter 5. Go there with me. I want to point this out because we're going to go back to the very beginning of things. The beginning as far as what is recorded. Because God has always existed. He is a self-existent one. Amen? No beginning of days. But as far as what is revealed, it belongs to us and our children. And so we're going to go in the scriptures and look at the beginning of things. And keep in mind that angels were created beings and they did, and even to them, God was revealing truth. The Bible says, pardon? That's true. Amen. 1 John chapter 5, verse 8. Speaking about the divinity of God. And just like as we grow up and we begin studying the word, you know the angels also have to study God's word. They have to study the, the words of, of God that comes from the throne and, and, uh, and look at his created things and look at the handiwork of, of the creator. And by those things, they are able to learn more and more about their creator. And they're able to reflect more and more of his image. So John chapter 5, it says in verse 8, it says, And there are how many? Three, Three that bear witness in earth. Uh, actually, we should probably go up to seven. Uh, for there are three that bear record where? In heaven. In heaven. The Father and who? The Word. And the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Now notice it mentions three people. Who are those three people? Father, Word, Holy Ghost. Okay, who was? Now the Father is pretty clear, isn't it? Yes. And uh, the Holy Ghost is pretty clear. Yes. Let's notice uh, who is the Word? Amen, sister. John chapter 1, verse 1. Let's go there and let's read it. John chapter 1, verse 1. Who is this word that was in heaven that was bearing record? John chapter 1, verse 1. Now I have, uh, okay, I can pull my cell phone out. That's what I'll do. I was about to say I have no recollection. I have no way of knowing how much time I'm. <laughs> so uh, we'll make do with as much time as we can. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was what? The word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was what? God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by who? Him. By Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Now, who was the Creator? Jesus, Jesus. Himself, the Word. And the Spirit, and the Father. They all created everything, but who did they create it through? Jesus. Notice what the Bible says in Colossians. Turn with me. It's either Colossians chapter 1 or Hebrews 1. I believe it's Colossians. Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Let's go there. Now, these three individuals are so much one in, in plan, in purpose, in power, um, that when God created all things, God actually says, and it says this in Genesis, we won't go there at the moment, but it actually says that when he created it, when he was about to create man, he actually uh, counseled the three individuals of the Godhead, came together and counseled and said, let us do what? Make man. Make man. But when 
man was actually created, which one of the individuals of the Godhead, as there's three of them, actually came and formed man and actually breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So God created, all three of them had a part of this, but the Bible says that all things were created specifically by Jesus. Notice what it says. Um, Colossians chapter um, 1 and verse, uh, we'll begin with verse 15. It says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Who is this speaking about? Jesus. Now, uh, we know that um, uh, throughout the previous context of the previous verses. In verse uh, 15 it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by Him were how many things? Oh. All things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, or dominion, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. So these three individuals, it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, are so in unison that whatever one of them does reflects the will and the power of all three. So when when uh, Jesus had created all things, it says, visible and invisible, it is God, all three of them were in, instrumental in, in this work. I want to take a moment uh, to identify um, a little bit about the, uh, now, ab about their different positions and their different workings. Now, many times throughout, I've never heard anybody actually um, argue about the position and place of God the Father. But I have heard a lot of dispute over the position of the Son and over the position of the Holy Ghost. So I'm going to take a moment. Now, the Father, it's pretty obvious God the Father, who He is throughout the Scriptures, and nobody challenges that. But I want to show one, uh, one specific element of the Father uh, that, that is, um, that's, uh, I guess, characteristics of their ministries, of their, th of their three individual ministries that they take. So uh, let's go to um, John chapter 14. Uh, excuse me, John chapter 1, pardon me. It's John chapter 1 and verse 18. I want to make, I want to spend just a moment, as all of them are all one, there is one God, all working in unison, one in power, and, and uh, uh, one in everything. Uh, they work in three distinct roles in the, minis in the ministry to their, to their creation. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, are you there? Mm -hmm. Alright. The Bible reads, No man has done what? Seen. Seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath done what? So has anybody seen God the Father? No. no, no. Yeah, and it's kind of yes. I guess uh, if you, and the reason being is because who hath declared him? Jesus. Jesus. Now, we have defined that God has not been seen by anyone. He's the creator. As a matter of fact, I believe his glory is so magnificent that he has to be, he has to be remain, he has to remain like basically shielded from our eyes because it would be overwhelming to us. But God wanted for us to be able to see him as, as much as we could. And so what did he do in order to allow us to be able to see him? Sent his son. He sent his son. Now I want to sh show you something. Does God change ever? No, he's perfect. So did God only allow his Im express image to be seen just in the life of Jesus when he came as a man? Now notice, go back with me to the book of Colossians. Go with me to the book of Colossians. And notice what it says. Now, we see in that, uh, you know, actually, I should have finished reading where we were in John chapter 1, where Jesus says to, uh, it says, have you not seen me, Philip, you know? Um, and we can see that in a minute. So let's, but we're already flipping to Colossians. Let's go there. Um, 
And notice what it continues to say, Colossians chapter 1. And uh, back into verse uh, 15. Colossians chapter 1. We've read the text before, but we're going to make another perspective, see another perspective of, of the verse. It says in verse 15, who? Now, who is the he? Is this word addressing? Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. It says, who is what? The image. the image of the invisible God. So what is one of the positions or offices that, that God the Son, uh, what ministry does He do, do for us? He is, he is God in a form, uh, in an image that we can see, that we can pattern our lives after. Amen. He is the image of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it in this way. I believe it's in the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Go there with me. Yeah, yeah. Hebrews chapter 1. I'm going to give you a little bit of Bible exercise. You're going to be flipping around, okay? This verse and that verse. That's good for you. Uh, Bible says Hebrews chapter 1 notice what it says um, we'll begin with verse 1 it says God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by who the now I'm, I read that because that's going to become necessary a little bit later in the message it says hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also who he did what made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and what kind of image he is the expressed image he is the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power so not only were everything's created by jesus but everything is upheld by jesus so what is so let's reflect for a moment so what is so far what have we discovered what is jesus's role in the godhead what? He's an ambassador to man. Uh, he takes up that position in order for us to be able to be able to see the invisible God in a way that we can uh, relate with, that we can see, and then we can pattern our lives after. And this is why the Bible actually calls him the begotten, or the first begotten, because he is the first that we are to pattern our lives after. And uh, we're going to get to that begotten in a, in a moment. So um, I'm going to go over to the board, Brother Michael, and uh, let me see the marker here. And we're discussing about, the, uh, about God here. So we have God the Father, right? Who is, uh, who's no man has seen, right? I don't know what word I want to write there, so I'll just leave it blank. Invisible, but um, I don't want it to conflict when I, you know, are talking about the Holy Ghost. So, and then in order to minister to man, um, you have Jesus. Well, I don't know if I'm comfortable film, put an arrow either. So you have Jesus. You know, you have to be very careful how you write things because people will misunderstand what you're trying to say and then it's on video and then people will be like, look at that devil, you know. <laughs> so I'm trying to be careful, but you know, you will make mistakes. Just, uh, you know, spirit of grace will help you to see. <laughs> so you have Jesus and he is specifically the expressed person, right? He is the expressed image. And then also, um, now, I, I didn't put arrows because I don't want people thinking that there's some like sort of chronological order as far as the Godhead. But I'll write the Holy Ghost over here. And maybe I'll circle this thing, that way there's no confusion <laughs> as far as the Godhead's concerned. Uh, so you have the whole ministry of the Holy Ghost. And... What is the ministry of the Holy Ghost? Because these three individuals are one. Now, how do we know that there's three distinct individuals? I know the baptism. The ba we made a reference to baptism. 
It's because when you look in the scriptures, the scriptures is very clear. You see the interplay of three distinct individuals uh, uh, um, interacting with each other. For instance, at the baptism, you have Jesus in the water. You have the Holy Ghost. Where is he? The dove came in the form of a dove. He is in bodily form as a dove. And then you have the voice of, uh, of the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Yes. Three distinct individuals. Uh, then you have in 1 John where it makes reference to them as three distinct individuals, three bearing witness. You have when we are to baptize and they spread the message, we are to baptize everybody in the name of who? The Father, the Father Son, Son, and Holy the Holy Ghost. So these three are one, but we're looking at their different um, offices that they perform in their ministry uh, to their children or to their creation. So when we looked at Jesus, it says he is the expressed image of God's Person. Now let's turn to the book of Romans real quick. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Notice what it says in verse, verse 29. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. Are you there, amen? The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to who? The image. the image of his Son. So what is God's desire? What is the purpose for his Son to be here? That we might, know him. That, we might that we might be conformed to his image, right? Okay, so what does this mean? When you're conformed to the image of God, notice what it says. Conformed to his image of his Son, that he might be what? So what does it mean that he's the firstborn? So when the Bible says he was the firstborn, was, was Jesus, does that mean that he was a created being? No. But what people will say is they'll argue and say, well, he was firstborn. But what does the Bible say it mean for him when it refers to him as being the firstborn? What is it making reference to, the, to this meaning? In other words, he's the image, express image of God and that we are to be conformed to that image. Yes. In other words, God is, God is allowing uh, Jesus to come as a man, and as we see him, it makes him as being the first, that we, that we may live our, and pattern our lives after him. So that's why the Bible calls him the firstborn. Even though there was people who was born before him, as far as a hum humanity in, in that sense. Um, so this is what it means for him to be part of the, uh, of the firstborn. And it says that he is to be that we, he is our pattern, that we are to conform ourselves after that image. And this is, this is the whole ministry that he has there. Now let's take a brief moment, and we don't want to leave the Holy Ghost out, because uh, so many people are denying his existence anyways. We don't want to do that. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, turn to the book of, of uh, Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9. Let's take another notice when we look at the ministry of, of, of God to his creation. Let's notice another aspect that he is, he is working here. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked. And the question that is posed, who can know it? And what is the answer? By the Lord, search the Verse 10. I, the who? The Lord. So who is speaking here? The Lord. This is the Lord. He says, the Lord searcheth the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So what does the Lord promise here that he would be working in our lives? How would he be working in our lives here? He's going to be searching your hearts and trying you. He's going to be speaking to you. He's going to be, he's going to be and uh, oftentimes when we make reference to our hearts, we're, we know that we're speaking about the conscience of man, the, the knowledge of uh, the judgment between good and evil. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the Bible, the Spirit of Prophecy talks about people who can have a diseased conscience. Um, conscience is m merely the, the knowledge of knowing what is good and what is evil. And you can have, you know, you can receive convictions mm -hmm. 
that are not correct and you can be convicted in your heart and you know that you can have a diseased conviction. Yeah. Now, what regulates that? Convictions. First John says that we should try the spirits, whether they be of God, right? You know, Disney likens a little cricket jumping around saying, uh, you know, uh, let your conscience be your guide. But did you know that you are not to allow your conscience to be your guide? You are allowed the Holy Ghost, <laughs> the Holy Ghost, God and his word to be your guide that will regulate your conscience, that will allow you to have right convictions. Did you know people who oftentimes uh, in the name of God who have murdered people? People who have joined uh, secret societies and drank Kool-Aid and all these different things. Did you know they were convicted? Isn't that what the extremist uh, Islamic? All kinds of extremists. Their conviction is that they should do these things, but their conviction is wrong. They have a diseased conscience. And you know that the Holy Ghost will heal your conscience? He'll heal it through the power of His Word. You read His Word and you pray and you give your heart over to God and He will regulate it and He will heal it and He'll give you a healthy conscience. So keep that in mind. That was a little side, a side note there. So the Bible says that God, He tries the rain. Now, notice what the Bible says as we look at specifically the office of God the Father, Holy, uh, the God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's notice whose office more specifically that follows falls in line with. Notice the Bible says in the book of, uh, I believe it's John, um, John chapter 16. Notice the Bible says in the book of John chapter 16, who is this, which, which member of the Godhead is more specifically in the direction of trying the heart? Now all of them are a part of it, but which one is specifically um, given that office in John Chapter 16, notice the Bible says, beginning with verse 7. That's John chapter 16. Which verse did I say? 7. All right, you're paying attention there. The Bible says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the who? Comforter. Now, who's the comforter? Holy Ghost. Now, again, we sing the interplay of Jesus very distinctly that Jesus is not the Holy Ghost. Because if Jesus was the Holy Ghost, or if the Spirit was just an essence of, of Jesus, none of this would make sense. Why is it expediently that I individually, in presence, go to the Father? Well, it's important that I go away to, to the Father, who's in another place, that way He can send the Holy Ghost. Very clear, the distinction of the interplay of three individuals. But notice what it continues to say. Uh, uh, with verse, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the, comfort, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, what will he do? Reprove He'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, why does it call him the Comforter? Because he comforted. When I was a young man up in that tree, who was, it, who was it that I didn't realize who was visiting me up there? I was looking for comfort. And the Holy Ghost was meeting me there. And I didn't realize it was Him. Uh, later the Lord introduced Himself to me and, I, and then now I see very distinctly that the invisible person who I fell in love with on the top of that tree was the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And He was representing the Father and the Son. All of them there were there with me in His presence. And the Bible says the Comforter. Now, uh, how, where do you receive comfort? You receive in your heart, don't you? you? Your heart's broken. You need some comfort, right? And not only does He comfort your heart when you're wayward away, but at the same time, but when you're in sin, what does He do? He reproves you. He reproves you. Shows you sin. Reveals to you righteousness. He regulates your conscience and so he shows you the right way. Uh, he does all this work. So this work that the Bible says, the Lord, I, the Lord, try the reins, is very clearly the office of the Holy Ghost. Now I want to notice something. If turned back to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And uh, I want to make some observations that some of you may have may be totally aware with, but sometimes uh, and, and it's not until someone says a key word that it clicks it all together. 
right? Is that fair? In the books of Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible begins in chapter 1 by talking, as we see in verse 3, you see very clearly that Jesus was the expressed image of God, and that was his ministry to his creation. And then verse 4, it clarifies who in the beginning he was, an he was the expressed image of. He, became, he was as expressed image, right? Has his ministry ever changed? No. So as long as there's been creation and created beings, there has been Jesus who has formed in an expressed image of God for them to see and pattern their life after. Correct? Okay. Verse 4, being made so much better than who? Now, who is the, who, as far as we know, as is revealed in the scriptures, who is the first created beings? The angels. The angels, right? Yeah. And they were created to, for what purpose? Minister. To minister to all the other created beings throughout the universe, correct? Mm -hmm. So how was Jesus an expressed image to all the angels? The Let's turn to the book of Jude. Let's turn to the book of Jude. How was Jesus the expressed image of God before he became, uh, before he became man in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, when he was bor born of Mary? In the book of Jude, the Bible says in verse 9, are you there? Yes. The Bible said, yet who? Michael. Michael. Who is what? The archangel. Now, what does the word ark, uh, what does that word signify? Highest, Highest angel. Highest, or in other words, first. Yes. Right? Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed over the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, what? The Lord. So this angel is saying, the, the, See the significance here. This angel is rebuking the devil, right? Mm -hmm. And what is he saying? The, the, an the, the archangel rebuke you? No, the, Lord. the Lord rebuke you, right? So this archangel, who is he? Jesus. He's the expressed image of, of God. He's the archangel. He was the one that all the angels were to be pattering themselves after. Um... But did all the angels want to pattern themselves after him? No. no, here we see there's a dispute here between Michael and who? Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation, chapter 12, and verse 7. Again, that's Revelation 12, verse 7. How much time do we have here? Oh, it's, it's actually time right now. Do you mind if I go a little bit over? No. Okay. Um, Revelation chapter 12. I won't go too far over. I know you, many of us enjoy our sleep and all. Um, Revelation chapter, uh, you know, everybody, all the other, men, all the other speakers have gone over. So. <laughs> it's for eight? Yeah. Oh, okay, then I have plenty of time. I've got another 30 minutes. Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says, verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Who? Michael. Michael. And who's Michael? Jesus. The archangel. And his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels. No, Michael, we say today, we say Jesus. he's Jesus. But when the, the events of this history was taking place, um, he wasn't known as Jesus. He's, he was Michael. But Michael and Jesus are the same person. Uh, matter of fact, I believe it's a uh, the first or second um, Thessalonians, um, the, the voice of the archangel, second. trump of God. Someone give me the chapter. I'm I'm getting a brain fog here. All right, let's go there. Second Thessalonians, chapter four. First, first Thessalonians. <laughs> I was testing you. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice what the scripture reads. Uh, let's see, verse uh, 16. Verse 16. Verse 16. 
It says for who? The Lord himself. Now it's, it's interesting that the wording here not only just says the Lord, but it goes on to reiterate it by saying for the Lord himself. Yeah. For the Lord himself, it says, shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of whom? The, arch the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Very clearly, the scripture identifies the archangel as being, uh, as being Christ. Uh, it's, it's Jesus, the same person. But before he was known as Jesus, he was the expressed image of God in the form of Michael, the archangel. Now, when we look at this, we can delve into the sanctuary service. And the sanctuary allows us to see more in type what is taking place as an antitype. In the throne room of God, where was his presence found in the sanctuary? Most yeah, obviously the most holy, right? <laughs> his throne, his throne is, is the law of, sits upon the law of God and covered with mercy. Right? And go with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 80. I believe it's Psalms, chapter 80. Um... Let's see, Psalms chapter 80, verse 1. And as his throne was there, who was in the presence of God? And as he is the expressed image of his person, uh, where was that expression of that image seen? Uh, there in the most holy place of him being at the archangel. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 80, Verse 1, the Bible reads, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between whom? The cherubims shine forth. Now, how many cherubims do we see in the most holy place? Well, you actually you see a lot of them all over the ta tapestry. But the Bible identifies specifically two as being set apart from the rest of them on the tapestry, right? Now, one of them is an express image of God, but who was the other covering cherub? Lucifer. Now go with me to uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Thank you. Chapter 24, 8. Let's see. Ezekiel. Is it 14? Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12, the Bible reads, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of who? Tyrus. Now was Lucifer the, son, the king of Tyrus? No. The king of Tyrus was his representative. Remember when Jesus rebuked Peter for saying something that was untrue? No. And what did he say? He looked right at Peter square in the eyes, and what did he say? <laughs> Who was he talking to? Was he talking to Peter? He's talking to Satan. Partially, yeah. but he was specifically talking to Satan. the one that Peter was, rep was, yeah. was reflecting the thoughts of, and that was Satan. And in here the Bible likens that unto this king of Tarsus, or those who were in a, a pagan power or king, um, which represented him. But no, he's not talking about the king of Tyre, uh, Tyrus. He's, he's specifically talking to the man who he represented. And that was Satan. We know this because obviously as you read through the description, uh, no per person on this earth has been in the direct presence of God walking up and down the stones as he has. But notice what it says. It says, uh, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been and eaten in the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Um, it says the... Sardas, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, I'm trying to speed this up, and gold, and the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in the end of the day that was created. Thou art who? The anointed cherub. Now, is he any kind of cherub? No, anointed. So, as being an anointed cherub, does that set him aside, apart from the rest of the cherubs or the rest of the angels? Yes, it does. He was the anointed cherub. And it says, um, Anointed cherub that does what? Covers. Covers, and I have set thee so. Now, even the word and name Lucifer itself means light. Light bearer. 
a light bearer. Now, what light? Was this any light that he was bearing? Was he walking around with a light bulb? No. Or a flashlight? Reflecting the light of God. He was reflecting the light of Jesus. Now, we're going to get into how it was that he was reflecting the light of Jesus. So, you have God the Father. You have Jesus in, in, in office standing before the Father in order to be a faithful reflection of Him in His person, express image of His person. And then you have an angel sitting beside Him who also has an office to assist Jesus, or assist Michael, right? Now, is it true that, that Jesus, or Michael, has, has a specific angel that He always works with? Turn to the book of Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 1. And we'll see that while Jesus, excuse me, Michael, was the ark or first of the angels to be an express image of his creation, to, that all the angels were to pattern themselves after, to be a revelation of God, that they may understand and learn of God through his person, that, that Jesus, or the, uh, excuse me, Michael, the archangel, had someone who was to be his servant or his assistant in this ministration. Notice what it says, Revelation chapter 1. And very clearly, Revelation chapter 1, it says, verse 1, the Bible says, the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. So that very sentence is telling you that this book is, who is it going to reveal? Jesus. It's all about showing us Jesus. Why is it about showing Jesus? Because through Jesus, the express image of God, we can see God and pattern our lives and, and look at Him and be changed in the same image. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God... Now, notice the interplay here and how it is. Now, God created all things, but did He provide for their further education and their, and their needs? It says that He also upholds the world, right, by, the, by His power. So how, it, what, how was it that God was upholding and he upholds, and he, and we see that he has ministering angels, right, to minister to all those. Um, and now we're seeing here, the Bible says that um, we're going to see directly his organization, how he allowed the the word of God to diffuse among the universe. He had a plan. He didn't just speak his word, and you could hear it as thunder throughout the skies. He actually had ministers going out and assisting in the in the diffusing of the light, right? Notice what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by an angel. angel. It says his angel unto his servant who? John. Now what was John doing? What was his office? He was a prophet. In other words, so God, through the way that he was sharing for, showing forth uh, knowledge that was to be light. He was the express image of God, and then he had an assistant, his specific angel, his angel, who then would go and give it to the prophets, who then would write and diffuse it among the worlds. Now, why do I say worlds? I'm thinking about Job. You know, the Bible we had read already in Colossians, also Hebrews, where it says also where he created, does it say that he also created the world? world. world. It actually says worlds. Now, what is that speaking about? Well, um, keep your finger there in Revelation. We're going to turn right back. Flip over to the book of Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Notice what the scripture reads. What does it mean when he says he created, of whom were he created the worlds? Plural. More than one world. The Bible says, Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Job chapter 1, which verse did I say? 6-6. Six. Six, six. You know, you have to throw those words out there because you can help people not fall asleep while they're <laughs> studying the Bible. You've got to get there a little participation. You know, it's one thing, it's especially hard for a working man. He's used to working and moving all week, working hard, feeding his family. And then he goes in church and sits still for two or three hours. And this is why they get tired and they get drowsy. It's like, uh, and, and that's why uh, singing hymns is so important because we actually get to physically participate in worshiping God through our voice and, and so on and so forth. 
And that's why the preacher should do his best to engage the congregation. Amen? Job chapter 1 and verse 6 got to help those hard workers out. And not, I'm not saying just only men are, but also you ladies, you work hard in your homes, and I, my, I have to take my hat off to you when it comes to children. Because uh, uh, it takes more patience and fortitude than, than any other office and service throughout uh, of mankind. <laughs> Job chapter 1, verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From where? Now why is he emphasizing from walking up and down in it? Why is he saying, Why I'm walking up and down in it? So in other words, one thing we learned from this is the sons of God is dealing with these are the sons that represented. These were the represented. This is where this was this was Adam's position to come represent the earth. And as an Adam is now gone, God points out to Satan, you don't represent the earth. Have you not considered my servant Job? In other words, I've chosen he is my representative. He represents earth, not you. But he says, he makes a claim that I am walking up and down on that earth. Now, what is the significance of that? I control the earth. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. What is the significance of him claiming, oh, I'm walking up and down on that earth? Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 7. Let's begin with verse 7. Uh, verse 6, pardon. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. Are you there? Yep. It says, But one in a certain place testifies, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the, the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection where? So what's the significance of him saying, I'm walking up and down? It's like, this planet is sub under subjection under my feet. That's the statement. That's what he was trying to say. And of course, you know that the Bible says that uh, uh, in the beginning, when uh, the serpent beguiled and Eve, as she claims, uh, that what did he do to the serpent? He took the legs off that serpent. He ain't walking up and down in, in this planet. I'm going to save it. I'm going to redeem it. So, uh, the Bible says that there was war in heaven, and I'm forgetting the last verse that we said we were going to go to. Revelation chapter 1. Go there again, Revelation chapter 1, and let's c continue to paint this, this uh, organization on how God is diffusing light to, to these worlds. God has worlds throughout the universe, and He has His patriarchs, or He has His represented there, His servants, or His prophets, and all these different planets that his angel is sent to, and what does that prophet do? Notice what it says. We read verse 1, it says, The angel came and unto his servant John, verse 2, who bear record of the word of who? God. Of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he had. So what here says that John had the gift of what? Testimony. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Now remember, this testimony was to testify of Jesus. Remember, everything is focused on Jesus. He is the, the one who's upholding by the, the word of his power, right? Mm -hmm. who, who we have life, springs of life from, that we derive our very being from. Our heart is pumping as a direct command from heaven, from Jesus. And here it says that throughout this process that God sends it with his uh, angel, and those other angels, you know, he's, they're uh, helping the ministry of the Holy Ghost as well. Uh, they're all working unified together. And uh, so here it says that he was, that John bare record that this process was the testimony of Jesus or the giving of his person to make known of his, of his brightness, right? So let's look at what is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Revelation chapter 19. And uh, it's either 10 or 15, let's see. 19.10. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Notice the scripture reads. 
Again, that's Revelation 19.10. Let's find out what this testimony is. So here we see an angel. The angel comes to John. And where do you think this angel came from? He came from Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus sent his angel, and now he's visiting John. And John gets confused because he sees the glory of God on this angel, and he, he, he misidentifies the angel. And he, what does he do? Verse 10 says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren that has what? The testimony of Jesus. It's be, the reason he had the testimony of Jesus is because he's, t he's, he's doing his part of relaying the testimony on to the, um, to the prophet who is representing the earth to and be able to be a mouthpiece and a message to record to the rest of the inhabitants of this earth. Amen? So it says here that this angel, it says... Uh, do it not, I am my fellow servant, thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is what? So those who are given the gift of prophecy are in link with the chain of what is called the spirit of prophecy, a revelation, a direct revelation of God's word to man. Amen. Not only was this servant John known as a prophet, but did you know that the, what he specifies as his angel is also a prophet? Because in this order of things, he is giving the testimony of Jesus Christ. He is a part of the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. That's 22.9, Revelation. So let's go to the, uh, the Bible and let's see that. Now, in the Bible, in Revelation chapter uh, 12, go there again. Revelation chapter 12. Notice what the scripture reads there. Now in the beginning, we know that we had the expressed image of God's person who was Michael the archangel. Mm -hmm. When Michael the archangel wanted to relay his message to the rest of the inhabitants of the universe, the way he chose to do that is through involving each and every individual that not only would we have the word delivered to us, but we would actually have a part in the message, a living part down through the chain of husband and wife, down to your families and your little ones. And this is the way that God has created all these things, that we would have a living part of not only hearing, but also delivering. Um, the Bible says, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the, it says, clothe the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child, cried, travailed in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red who? Dragon. A great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail did what? Drew the third, Drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Now, first, before we go on, let's identify who this dragon is. Who is that dragon? In verse 9, the Bible reads, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called who? The devil. the devil and Satan. So here we see this dragon. Now, before he was the devil and Satan, who was he? Lucifer. He was Lis Lucifer. And those were those uh, verses we had read, if we continued reading about them, how the Bible says that you've been my anointed covering cherub, but you have sinned, you've fallen, you threw all your, the merchandise of, and it goes on talking about the nature of his sin. So he had fallen. So was he any longer the his angel, the, the, the angel of Michael? No. No. So he, so what happened to that position? It was refilled. <laughs> Who refilled it? Gabriel. Gabriel. Notice the Bible says, now keep your finger there in the book of Revelation, we're going to go right back to 12 and go over to the book of Daniel. Daniel, notice the Bible says in Daniel chapter 8. As you go through the scriptures, you will only find the names of these three angels. You don't find the Bible naming any of the other angels other than Michael the archangel and, Lucifer. and then Lucifer. Now, how many specific angels that said it was um, stood apart from the rest of the angels? There was two between the, the, the cherubs shine forth, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and um, 
there was specifically two, and I think it's in the book of Exodus chapter, was it 20, 25, I think, where it talks about those two. Um, so here we're going to, uh, where did I tell you to go? Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, okay. I was losing my thought as those wrinkles are creeping in in the corners of my face. Uh, Daniel chapter 8, notice the Bible says, I believe verse 6. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 6. Oh, it is, uh, okay, it's not 6, it's 16. The Bible says, now this is, now who is the prophet here on this world? Daniel. Daniel, he's representing the world, he's going to bear record of the spirit of prophecy, the word of God to all mankind on this earth. He's, he's representing Jesus, testifying of Jesus, and, it, and notice with who's the angel that's delivering it to him. Verse 16, And I heard a man's voice between the banks, Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Now whose voice is this? Jesus. This is Michael's, yeah. talking to his angel, yeah. telling to deliver the testimony of, of, of God, uh, Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, to his prophet to deliver to man. So now that angel was, when Lucifer fell, he was replaced by Gabriel. But the Bible says that when he fell, he became this dragon, and he was wroth with God's people. It says, Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as he was born. Now keep your finger there, turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, notice what it says in verse 20. It says that this dragon cast down a third of the stars of heaven. What is the significance there? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, notice what the Bible reads. It says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are who? The angels of the seven churches. So in the scriptures, who represents stars? Angels. The angels of God. So this dragon cast, how did he cast down a third of the angels out of heaven? Now think of the, the very nature of his office. The very nature of his office to be the, 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 his angels of Jesus, of, of Michael. Who was then to orchestrate and assist also in the diffusion of light to not only God's prophets, prophets of the representatives of the other world, but he was to diffuse that light to the rest of the angels that they could have part of, also ministering to all of the, of the people of all the different universes. Or, excuse me, uni uh, worlds of the universe, right? It should have been truth. And he was supposed to look at the very throne room of God. Now those angels in heaven, they're depicted looking over the mercy seat. And what are they staring at? What's inside that ark? The law. The law. Which is the, the transcript of God's character. So do you think Lucifer, more than any other angel, re knew yeah. the character of God? Uh -huh. But these things, as the angels are looking down at the, at the law of God, they're looking through the mercy seat. So they're seeing the law of God demonstrated through his mercy. Yeah. And he knew the character of God. You know, Steps of Christ that talks about how Satan went forth to misrepresent the character of God, mm -hmm. to represent him as an exacting tyrant whose chief attribute is, a, is to, to, uh, to basically, uh, to, 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 I, I'm tearing up the quote, I better stop. <laughs> he just, uh, don't, he's an exacting tyrant and, and he misrepresented the character of God, that way people, his children would turn away from him and that's what he did to the angels. He misrepresented, and a third of the angels of heaven was drawn to his rebellion as he re misrepresented God. He abused his holy office. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do when we sin. Amen. Amen. Praise God for his mercy. And uh, hopefully we won't go far as Lucifer to become uncourageable, mm -hmm. that we won't grieve the Holy Spirit as Lucifer did. The Bible says, Revelation chapter 12, it says that he drew out a third of these angels right into this rebellion, 
But what was the tool that he used to draw them out? His tail. It says his tail, right? What was that instrument? It was the instrument of his tail. Now notice the Bible. And I was, remember I was telling you that the angel is a prophet, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Notice the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 9. nine. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15. Isaiah chapter 9, what was this tale? The Bible says, Isaiah chapter 9, are you there? Yes. The Bible says, the ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the what? Prophet that the prophet that teaches lies, what is he? He is the tail. So what became, what became of Lucifer? He was a prophet of God, given the testimony of Jesus Christ, and he became a soothsayer, just like Balaam did, and taught the people of God to sin misrepresented God's character, told him, I've seen the foundation of God's government and it's wrong. Mm -mm. And he went into his terrible rebellion. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which be ready to be delivered to, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. The Bible says there was war in heaven, verse 7, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragons fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there a place found in any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which does what? His dis so he went from trying to enlighten the whole world about God's character to deceive the world about God's character. He was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. And uh, we're going to close there at this verse. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, for the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuseth the brethren before God day and night. Actually, I want to show one last verse, and we'll close there. Turn with me to Zechariah. I believe it's Zechariah. Chapter 4. We already looked at Jude and we saw Michael, and there's the devil arguing with him over who? Over Moses. And again, we're going to see here in Zechariah again the same depiction. The, it was said he was cast out and it called him the accuser of the brethren, right? So, what did Satan do? Now he stands and represents. And he's just there accusing and accusing and accusing and accusing, tearing down, lying about God's, lying about, he stands between God and his precious children. Instead of being diffusing the light, he's trying to stand in the way of the light, to block the light, to block the radiant beams of God's mercy, to, to block away the, the gift of eternal life, to block away the, the, thing, the power which God upholds the worlds by. And he upholds every one of us individually by that power, that vital energy. He's in the way to block it and to lie about it and to try to get you to be divorced and separated from that power. Zechariah, our ending text. Um, let's see, is it Zechariah chapter 4, I believe? Zechariah chapter 4 about the high priest. Joshua. Okay, uh, we'll st start in... Uh, No, that's not the exact one I want. It might be another chapter. Let's see, um, I believe it's chapter 3. It's chapter 3. Let's notice what the Bible says. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Yeah. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. It says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to do what? Resist. To resist him. You know, when you give your life to Christ, Satan will resist you. He'll, he'll resist God in, his, in the way of trying to work salvation in your life. Many of us will feel that battle. It says, to resist in verse 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord does what? Rebuke. He rebukes you, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand, what? Plucked, plucked out of the fire. In other words, God plucked you from being lost in, in the burning. 
Now when Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. A change of raiment, yes. And I said, Let him set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by, and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua. And I think we'll close there. God wants to give us the reconnect the link that was broken through an unfaithful prophet, through an unfaithful angel that created all this great controversy. Boy, this little fly is just determined. <laughs> and uh, he wants to stand in the way, but God is going to rebuke him. Amen? And we're going to pick up to part two uh, the next time I speak, whenever that is. You can look on your schedule. Um, let us close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we have been assailed by a false prophet. And Lord, we ask you forgiveness to listen, for listening to his lies. And we thank you, Lord, that you revealed your love so much to us that now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God. Mm -hmm. That when you send your Son, not only to be the express image to the angels, but further has made himself an express image also to humanity in coming as a man and dying for our sins to bring us salvation, to relink the, to, to, to heal the, 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 uh, the break of the communion as a result of that false prophet standing against you. We pray, Lord, that you would save us and that you would continue to teach us the plan of salvation. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be relinked back to your heavenly throne and can reconnected to that source of vitality. And as we come together at our next meeting, Lord, we pray that you would bless us to understand that link, more about that link that exists between you and man and that plan of salvation and that vital connection of righteousness by faith. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.